All right, I think uh, you know we have quite a few people in here now. Let's get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, in today's presentation, we are going to attempt to go over some of the major bottlenecks the shipping industry is currently facing. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, so we are going to try to answer the question of why before getting into more of the effect, since I think we're all currently feeling the effects. Uh, but yeah, let's get started. So my name is Meredith Lambert. I will be your host and presenter during today's presentation. I'm the marketing manager here at Trade Risk Guarantee, which basically translates into being responsible for researching and creating the educational content for all of you, including things like this very webinar. Joining me today is Felicia Donahue. She is the Marine Insurance Manager here at TRG, and she is going to be covering the insurance portion of this presentation, as well as answering your questions during the Q&A, uh, during the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Uh, so make sure to stay to the end if you have questions. She's going to be helping with that. This webinar is being presented by Trade Risk Guarantee, or as many of you know us as, TRG. We are located in the heart of downtown Bozeman, Montana, and have been providing U.S. customs bonds and cargo insurance solutions directly to importers since 1991. This direct-to-importer business model is unique to the in international trade community since it cuts out the need for an additional middleman and allows TRG to become another member of your international trade team. We will be recording this webinar and it will be available on our YouTube um, channel for future reference. If you want to be notified the moment it releases, I highly recommend you subscribe to our YouTube. Uh, we also post additional educational videos on YouTube about once a month. So if you're not already and you're interested, you can find us there. Um, you can find us by searching trade risk guarantee hyphen TRG in the YouTube interface. Um, a link to subscribe will also be sent out with the webinar recording as a follow-up to today's uh, to today's attendees. Um, and we also will be putting that link in the chat of the webinar interface. Uh, remember to please submit your questions in the question box in the webinar interface throughout the presentation. We will be answering as many of them as we can at the end. For any that we run out of time or that we're not able to answer, um, you know, we do tend to get a lot of highly specific questions, um, questions that are just too involved to answer in a um, mass webinar like this one. Um, we will be submitting those questions to be reviewed and answered either by myself or our team of licensed customs brokers and cargo insurance experts um, after the webinar. Now, as a quick reminder, this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. Okay, let's get started. So in today's uh, webinar, we will be focusing on three primary topics. We are going to start with the current container shortage. Uh, we're going to go over the Suez, Suez Canal blockage and how that continues to impact the entire situation. And finally, we are going to discuss a few ways to minimize the effect these, effect these circumstances have on your cargo insurance. So let's begin. Um, we're we're going to begin with kind of the elephant in the room, the current container shortage. Now, there are a lot of factors at play here, so we are going to begin with the why, uh, like I kind of said before because that will help us understand kind of what needs to happen to alleviate the situation. Well, speaking of elephants in the room, we're going to start with the effect the pandemic has had on the container shortage. Now, there are a lot of factors to consider about the shortage, but unfortunately, a lot of them do start with the pandemic and the lockdowns that began in early 2020. At the start of the pandemic, many countries went into lockdowns, um, which either slowed down or completely halted the production of goods in those countries. Now, a natural result of that um, is that uh, shipping companies had a significantly decreased amount of cargo being sent between countries. This completely disrupted the usual flow of imported and exported goods. Now, we all were were and are still aware of the overall shortages of goods across many different industries. However, although it was less discussed at the time, 
Another result of this slowdown in traffic back and forth was that many empty containers were not being collected and transported as they normally would have been. The most significant example of this can be seen in the America regions where Asian containers didn't, could not be sent back due to COVID-19 restrictions. As the situation progressed, China being the first country impacted by COVID began to recover while other countries were just beginning to feel the effects. This meant that China was able to resume its import and export trade while other countries could not. This information kind of sets the stage for the entire container shortage conversation. But the next natural question is, where have all the containers gone? The short answer to this is that many containers have been left sitting at inland depots while others have been stacking up at cargo ports with no way to get where they are most needed. This answer, while accurate, uh, is very frustrating and immediately makes us all want to know why these containers are, have been left unused. One reason is the staggered recovery and lockdown status from country to country. This goes back to the information on the previous slide where we mentioned that China began to recover while other countries were just beginning to feel the effects of the pandemic. So other countries were just beginning their lockdown or were deeply entrenched in the midst of it, um, causing containers to not be sent back to Asia where they were really needed at the time. In the meantime, Asia began ex exporting again. Um, so sending more containers out to other countries where they would basically end up sitting at a port without a return journey. Another reason for, the, for many containers sitting unused has been the staffing deficiencies at major ports. Now this is particularly relevant at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach where container ships have had to sit an average of more than seven days waiting for a space to berth and be unloaded. This has, uh, this has led to a backlog of ships waiting off the shores of California, sometimes up to 50 ships at a time. The lack of staff is a direct, or sorry, has a direct effect on the container shortage since it leaves both full and empty containers sitting on board ships for much longer than usual. This particular situation is an example of the long reaching effects of one hiccup along the supply chain, since a major cause of the lack of staff at these ports is due to the fact that many port workers tested positive for COVID um, and had to refrain, refrain from going back to work. Um, back in February, this goes back to February of 2021, so a few months now, um, about 800 longshore and dock workers for the port of LA Long Beach were not at work due to the fact that they were either suffering from COVID-19 or were under stay-at-home orders due, due to the fact that they were in direct contact with a COVID-positive individual. Um, so they were unable to return to work and, you know, continue unloading ships as they normally would. Uh, this is really the beginning of the major port congestion at these specific ports. Uh, so that, in addition to the spike in imported goods at these ports, has created a backlog that was originally projected to last until at least the beginning of June. This translates to delays in the arrival of goods, but it also means that containers are not being unloaded and made available for their next journey as quickly as in previous years, or as quickly as usual, really. The next point is a little trickier since uh, there's not really an end in sight. Uh, there has been a massive shortage of truck drivers within the United States. Now this is by no means a new problem. In fact, the American Trucking Association estimates that there was a shortage of about 61,000 truck drivers at the end of 2019. The pandemic not only increased the need for truck drivers, but it also made it difficult to train new drivers throughout 2020. Chris Spear, the president and CEO of the American Trucking Association, stated that over the next five to 10 years, the trucking industry will have to hire more than a million people just to meet the current demand. American truckers currently move 70% of all domestic goods within the United States. The majority of goods that make it on the shelf of US stores has been on at least one truck somewhere in its journey. 
During the start of the pandemic, many trucks were being rushed from state to state in an effort to get supplies on the shelf for consumers. Uh, so, you know, things were moving very quickly. Um, and a lot of times that meant that they were maybe having to leave the containers. And again, containers were getting stranded. So the shortage of truck drivers has resulted in many containers being left sitting at inland depots, depots waiting for a way to get to where they can be used. So the priority is put on transporting full containers in order to decrease delay in the delivery of goods. Another factor to consider is the general retiring of old and damaged containers. Now this um, is and has been standard practice in the industry for years in order to ensure that containers being used for transport meet modern safety and security requirements. Containers are typically retired after about 18 years of service. Every year, thousands of used uh, Mers Maersk line containers and reefers retire and are no longer used for their main purpose. In light of the container shortage, some lines have discussed the possibility of deferring the retirement of older containers that are still in good shape, but this does result in taking on a certain amount of risk that most companies are not willing to take on. So one solution to the shortage would be to make more, right? <laughs> uh, but of course, that is not as simple as it sounds. Um, in fact, the truck, uh, sorry, in fact, like the trucking staffing issue, the container manufacturing industry didn't enter 2020 in a good position um, as production and sales had dropped in China throughout 2019. Uh, primarily due to the pandemic at the end of March 2020, there was a huge surplus of containers with more than 3 million empty 20 foot containers sitting at Chinese ports and 1.2 million in storage at container manufacturers. This decrease in demand led to a natural decrease in container production that has now contributed to the current situation. In the chart on the screen, you can see that container manufacturing drastically de de decreased in Q3 of 2019 and continued at that lower level throughout the first three quarters of 2020. Now container manufacturers are scrambling to meet the surge in demand. Uh, production uh, rose to 300,000 20-foot equivalent units in September and then to 440,000 in January 2021. However, this increase is not enough to make up for the fact that there aren't enough used boxes being returned to China to be filled and re-exported. So let's do a quick recap of all the factors we just discussed and how they are connected. This graphic, while a little rough, um, illustrates how all of these individual factors contribute to the overall container shortage, but are also contributing to each other as well. So kind of um, on the outskirts of all of this is the retiring of old containers. This factor contributes to the store shortage, but is mostly an island onto itself since it is a constant within the industry. Then we move over to the truck driver shortage. This factor also directly affects the container stuck inland, the port congestion, and the manufacturing scramble, since there are not enough trucks to physically move empty containers from point A to point B. Then we can look at the shortage of port, port workers. This has an obvious effect on port congestion, but it also affects the number of containers stuck inland and the manufacturing scramble, since there, again, are simply not enough people to facilitate this movement and get containers out of the way, so to speak. Uh, we're gonna skip over the manufacturing scramble since it is mostly being affected by these other factors. Um, so on to port congestion itself. Uh, we just discussed how port congestion has an effect on the manufacturing scramble in the last slide, but it also has an effect on the amount of containers stuck inland since there is not enough Oh, sorry, there is not enough storage space for empty containers to occupy at certain ports. So the containers have to remain where they are until space is cleared. And finally, the container stuck inland affects the manufacturing scramble the same way port congestion does by exacerbating the problem um, and making it even more of a scramble. So now we can see how kind of one grain of sand in the process really knocks the entire ecosystem off kilter.
Speaking of knocking the system off kilter, let's jump over to discuss the blockage of the Suez Canal. Uh, before we do, though, we have to um, kind of acknowledge the fact that incidents occur very fre frequently to goods and ships while they are in transit. In fact, we have an entire series of blog posts covering different events that have resulted in lost containers, general average, and more. The difference with this situation specifically is that it put an entire major trade route on hold. So while other situations, um, uh, in other situations, unaffected ships were able to continue on their way, this situation left almost no one unaffected. Let's start with a little bit of background on the Suez Canal um, and its importance within the industry. The Suez Canal is an artificial sea, sea oh, sorry, is an artificial sea level waterway in Egypt, connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea and dividing Africa and Asia. About 12% of all global trade passes through the canal, which equates to about 19,000 vessels per year or 51.5 vessels per day. In the event that the Suez is blocked, the alternative route requires a ship to sail south and around the Cape of Good Hope before heading back north on the other side of Africa. Um, this is considered a much more risky route um, as it, um, I mean, I'm sure Felicia can talk more on this when we get to the insurance side of things, but there's just much more um, potential for incidents on this alternate route. Uh, so the Suez not only is, you know, considered safer, but it also allows ships ships to um, decrease their journey time by approximately 10 days and by 3,500 nautical miles. So now a little background information on the 2021 obstruction and the ship itself. In March of 2021, the Ever Given was buffeted by strong winds, which resulted in the container ship getting wedged across the Suez Canal, completely blocking the waterway for six days. The Ever Given is about 400 meters long, making it one of the longest ships in, uh, currently in service. It weighs 200,000 tons uh, and has a maximum capacity of 20,000 containers. At the time of the incident, it was carrying 18,300 containers. The blockage of the Suez Canal created a major bottleneck for, bottleneck for international trade. By the time the traffic through the Suez resumed, more than 400 ships were waiting to make their way through the canal. Although this initial backlog was cleared within a week or so, the overall delays continue to be felt throughout the industry. This can most immediately be seen by the fact that many of those delayed ships were headed to the same ports, causing an increased amount of congestion at already busy ports. As we have already discussed, these port backlogs have a drastic effect on the availability of containers, since it ultimately determines when containers can be emptied and refilled with other goods bound for somewhere else. Jan Hoffman, um, an expert with the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, stated that the bottleneck caused by this one event could last several months. So if we go back to our earlier graphic, we can now add the Suez Canal blockage as another contributing factor to the overall container shortage, which also is adding to the port congestion that was already very strained. So what is the current status of the Ever Given? Well, in late April, Egypt detained the ship, her 26-person crew, and millions of pounds in cargo, demanding its owners pay compensation for the blockage. The legal battle is waging between the ship's owners, insurance companies, and the Suez Canal Authority. And while it wages, the ship is currently sits in the Great Bitter Lake within the Suez Canal awaiting a resolution. So the ship is literally just sitting and waiting. The SCA was originally seeking $916 million, but has since stated that they are prepared to accept a settlement of $550 million. The ship owners and, and insurance feel that this um, amount is inflated without further insight into how the total was calculated. The closest thing that they have really received to a breakdown is a statement from the SCA listing 
$300 million as a salvage bonus and a further $300 million for loss of reputation and physical damage to the canal. Ultimately, this means that the 18,300 containers on board the ship are still sitting on board the Ever Given. Uh, that is taking more containers out of rotation and leaving goods from a variety of companies stranded for the time being. So what has the effect on the industry been? Um, I know that every individual attending today's webinar has felt these effects, so let's look at you know, at least the major one. Now, the most pressing effect outside of delays um, has been the extreme price increases on the cost of containers. And while the price is ultimately dependent on the origin and destination ports involved in the journey, every route has experienced increases. You can see some of the differences in price increases in the chart on the slide, which looks at different routes, all starting in Shanghai. Now, between 2016 and uh, 2020, um, container rates have fluctuated, but have never exceeded about $3,000 per, con per container. Now, the rate for a standard 40-foot container shipping from Shanghai to Rotterdam is up by 485% to an unbelievable $10,174. That route does seem to be the one experiencing the most intense price increase. However, the average across the board has increased by 293% to an average of 6,257. Now, these averages were calculated uh, by the uh, Drury Shipping Consultants uh, within their data and was um, calculated as of May 27th, 2021. So obviously, you know, all of those prices are still fluctuating. So uh, those averages might have gone up at this point. So one of the most asked questions we have gotten has been, when will there be a return to normal, particularly in terms of pricing? Well, to be completely honest with you, it is really hard to give any type of answer to this, any type of concise answer to this. Uh, but we can look at a few factors that need to ease in order for a return to normal to be possible. First off, port congestion. There have been predictions that congestion at ports such as LA and Long Beach should begin to ease around the middle of summer. This prediction is primarily based on the increased availability of the vaccine throughout the United States since understaffing was significantly impacted by workers testing positive for COVID. There has also been a greater push toward rerouting ships to other less congested ports to ease the burden. Similarly, as more restrictions are eased country to country, we will hopefully see more containers making their way to the places they are needed most, which brings us back to the fact that the major, con that, oh, sorry, that major container manufacturers are currently working to make more containers available. The easing of these bottlenecks will help toward bringing international trade back to more normal levels. However, most experts do not expect this easing to begin until the end of 2020 or early 2022. Now, we did receive a number of questions about how to minimize your shipping costs um, in terms of container costs. And to be honest, those types of creative solutions are really best discussed specifically with your freight forwarder. I really wanted to focus on the why in this presentation in order to give us all a more tangible way to track and plan for the future of the industry. However, the price increases seen are primarily a result of simple supply and demand. The supply is at an all-time low and the demand is at a real high. Um, unfortunately, there are some companies and, and industries that are taking advantage of this fact. Um, I have heard stories of orders being canceled and contracts being broken because a freight provider found someone that would pay a premium for the same container or the or the same route. I hate to hear these stories. Uh, it really, you know, stinks. Uh, but the only thing I can really advise is that you try to work with the reputable companies that you trust um, and that you trust are not doing this. Um, it is a difficult time across many industries, um, you know, even outside of international trade. And at some points, things will begin to ease back to some semblance of normal. Um, we can really see how 
you know, one bottleneck creates another bottleneck down the line and so on. There has been a lot of talk uh, in the, in kind of the, uh, the overarching topic of international trade about how these bottlenecks are just really highlight the flaws in the system and you know how can we make the system of the supply chain better those are bigger questions that you know i don't really know if we're going to see an answer to quickly um but this really does highlight the fact that again one one flaw in the system really throws the entire thing off and this year especially this past year especially has been one flaw after another it's just kind of you know the perfect storm, as they say. So since we are an insurance agency, we have to take a moment to talk about how to protect yourself in terms of insurance. For this section, I'm gonna pass it over to Felicia to go through a few tips to keep in mind, and then we will you know, start getting into that Q&A. So Felicia, if you'd like to take on over. Perfect, thank you, Meredith, and hello, everyone. Um, so the very first point that I want to go over with you is monitoring your supply chain flow and identifying areas where goods might be stopped and really keeping an eye on those pain points. Um, knowing where your cargo will be helps you to be proactive for when the, when the potential for a bottleneck becomes a probability. Um, when you see a problem coming, it allows you to make a plan ahead of time and institute it smoothly rather than scrambling um, while you're in a pinch. Uh, that might mean using an alternate transit route or uh, it might ensure, mean that you need to ensure that you have proper storage space arranged if you see that your cargo is going to be waiting. It's also really important during this process that you're communicating with your cargo insurance provider to make sure that any changes you're making in your operations won't open up any unexpected gaps in your coverage. And then the next point that I want to go over with you guys is uh, you know, identifying additional warehouse needs and contacting your insurance provider about them. When goods transfer from you to you from your vendor, but they can't be shipped yet due to delays because either there's no container or there's no ship route, you may need to put your cargo into storage indefinitely until you can make those arrangements. Most cargo insurance policies do not automatically cover this type of temporary storage and require special coverage be endorsed onto your policy. Um, there are a few options with that, so partnering with your insurance provider to look at all of your options and identify the coverage that meets your risk management goals in the most cost-effective way um, to make sure that your financial interest in your cargo is still protected is key. And then point number three is pay attention to accumulation. Uh, cargo unexpectedly ending up in one place, whether that be on a ship, on an aircraft, or another mode of conveyance can happen. Most policies provide coverage for accumulation up to double your usual limit, but that coverage is contingent on you notifying your insurers when accumulation occurs. And depending on how much of your cargo is accumulating, even that double limit may not be sufficient to fully cover the value of your cargo. Um, it's really important to monitor how much value you have in your warehouse as well. Um, if you start to get close to your limit or if you know you're going to exceed it because of accumulation, you could not only be uninsured for the difference between the limit and you know the full value that you have in your warehouse, you could also suffer underinsuring penalties, um, reducing any claim payment in proportion to how underinsured your cargo was at the time of the loss in your warehouse. And then my last bit of advice for you guys is make sure you're identifying goods which may be subject to delay and ensure that you have proper intermediate storage conditions uh, such as temperature controlled facilities. Losses due to delay are typically not covered under marine cargo insurance or by the shipping line. Since there is a lot of reduced capacity at a lot of storage facilities due to these bottlenecks, Having arrangements in place ahead of time ensures continuous safe handling of your cargo. 
even though there is reduced space at many facilities, it's still really critical that you find a proper storage partner because avoiding a claim altogether is going to be better for your business's bottom line. You really want to avoid a claim um, altogether if possible. Okay, so now we're gonna open up the discussion for some questions. Um, remember to submit those questions in the question box um, in the webinar interface. We've got a few already, uh, but while we kind of gather those questions and allow you guys to kind of type them out, um, I'd like to take a moment to just talk about TRG. At TRG, we sell directly to consumers. So rather than purchase through a third party, we're going to help you out by letting you buy direct. And that gives you an option for lower pricing and very competitive customer service and claims assistance. In addition to providing US Customs Bonds, we also write all risk annual cargo insurance policies. We are also proud to announce that we are able to offer more flexible pricing options than ever in an effort to help importers protect their cargo while protecting their immediate cash flow. All of our policies are written through the Lloyds of London or the AXA XL Catlin markets. Now, Lloyd's of London is the largest insurance market in the world. They basically created cargo insurance, uh, while AXA XL um, is a domestic provider that enables us to underwrite policies at a low price. Now, we offer local representation. If you have a loss, you are going to be speaking directly with Felicia and her team, but that doesn't mean that we can't handle the loss anywhere. We have representatives around the world ready to help in, case, um, in the case of a loss, to make sure that you get paid the right amount quickly. Finally, our policies are custom. We offer all three, international, domestic, and warehouse coverage, and they are wrapped around your business. They are not blanket policies. These are not off the shelf policies. These are policies written directly for you based on your business, making sure you have the coverage you need. Our annual all risk policies start at some of the lowest annual costs in the market. All right, so we're gonna take a, a minute here to go through some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, just as a quick, I know I'm gonna let Felicia kind of take over in a second here, but I did see one that I just quickly wanted to address. Um, and the question was, what about the effect of the um, Yantian closure and overall um, and lower overall flow of containers? So I didn't include this in the presentation since it is currently an ongoing situation. I probably should have uh, talked about it. Um, a lot of times I like to kind of talk about the effect um, as opposed to just what's happening at the moment. Um, but there is a current closure of the, um, at the port um, in the Yantian port in China. So it is due to a COVID-19 outbreak. Um, currently the entire port is completely closed. Uh, this is really, uh, I, it's hard to say what the effect's going to be other than to say it's, going to have a major effect. This is a very busy port. They handle about 13 million um, TEUs of, of, you know, goods. Uh, it's, it's a major port for uh, items going from China to Europe and the U.S. So this is just another, you know, I mean, it, it's hard to kind of like talk about these things and keep going back to the same issue. The, the fact that we are still in this pandemic state of of being you know i mean that covid 19 outbreak is still having an effect um there are still cases happening um so really the only the only answer there is hopefully it gets better as you know more vaccines go out more time goes by things like that um but yeah this is going to definitely affect the overall container flow in the same way that the Suez Canal blockage did and all of all of these other factors did. Um, you know, you're going to see less containers moving quickly. That port's completely closed. So I'm sure there's tons of um, empty containers sitting at that port that are not going to be moved right now. So unfortunately, the answer there is that it's, it's kind of getting a little bit worse before we hopefully see it get better. Um, but now, yeah, um, the, it, also, we did receive a question about how many containers are currently sitting. Uh, there's not really a number that we can find. Um, it, it's very much, I mean, granted, it, it keeps uh, fluctuating, so it's kind of hard to get a, um, a 
actual number, but I'm sure it's significant. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna pass it over to Felicia now who has also had some questions submitted. Great, thank you. So um, one of the first questions we got was, um, will these high freight prices and cargo, you know, just sitting around waiting impact my insurance premiums? And the answer is most likely yes. If you want to be covered for your freight costs during a claim, which is typical on your, your cargo insurance, then premium has to be paid on the current freight expenses. It's kind of just like you wouldn't want to only be paid on your outdated, outdated pricing from a few years ago. Um, insurers need to be paid on current freight because that's what they would be paying out on a claim. And they have to make sure they're collecting enough premium to be able to pay claims in full. Uh, another question we got is, um, are there other ways to get a container shipped besides cargo ships? Does our cargo insurance cover if we ship by air? And this is a great question. You know, it, being creative and being proactive and looking at alternative options is, is great. Uh, definitely there is air options. Um, I mean, depending on your budget, you could even look at chartering your own ship for transit. Um, pretty much any way you ship can be covered under your cargo insurance, but it's very important that before you start changing how you ship that you are communicating that with your insurer uh, because they may need to formally put that in your policy as an endorsement. Um, they may need to rewrite your policy because it's either more expensive or less expensive. Um, and, you know, they, the other thing to just keep in mind is a lot of other people are asking that question as well. So some of those backup alternative options are, are starting to see bottlenecks too, like air freight, um, you know, and kind of some of the same issues that we're seeing with ocean freight of, you know, reduced capacity, uh, reduced staffing, um, reduced routes, that sort of thing. Another question I'm seeing is what countries or regions are seeing the most problems when it comes to availability of containers and freight routes? And really this comes down to the most popular trade routes are going to have less availability. You know, they're, they're popular for a reason. Uh, there are almost always alternative shipping routes, but it's important that you don't compromise the safety of your shipment for the sake of shipping sooner or shipping faster. Um, because then you might not get your cargo at all. Um, Meredith, when we were talking about the Suez Canal, had mentioned, you know, going one of those alternative routes um, being more risky. And, you know, that's true. It, when you go around, um, go south, there's a higher risk of piracy and a higher risk of bad weather. And, you know, the longer cargo is on the water, the more likely something is that it will happen to it. So longer freight routes, it just in general, are a little more risky. Uh, another question that I am seeing is, you know, will the world governments get involved with out of control price hikes for ocean freight? And, you know, I have not seen any discussion of this. Um, I think the short answer is no, because there's no one single entity with the authority to step in. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's international trade. Um, so it would be very hard to regulate, uh, very, very hard to control. Um, and then just going back to that one of that, that previous question about freight routes um, and, and that sort of thing, one other point I just want to, to mention is make sure if you are changing your freight routes um, that you are communicating that with your, your insurance provider as well. Um, there are different regulations for different countries um, and you know, you want to make sure that you're not ever going to get a nasty surprise that something isn't covered because you didn't ask. So overshare rather than undershare if you're coming up with any creative solutions uh, for getting your cargo moving. Uh, another question I'm seeing is why is there also a shortage of chassis once the containers arrive at local container guards? And this pretty much comes back to a lot of the same reasons that there's a shortage of containers and a shortage of routes. Um, you know, old chassis are being retired and manufacturing was ramped down. Um, some fleets are getting older and, you know, it's taking a while to replace them. Uh, and, you know, it's taking longer to get used chassis back to the people who need them. Yeah, so um, another question that we got here was, uh, when do they expect um, Yantian to open again? 
Uh, this is a little hard to answer. They've um, basically they've ramped up testing in the area, and there's some reports saying that cargo will be accepted by appointment only. Um, I don't. I mean, I obviously don't really know what that's going to mean. Um, but it really just sounds like they're still kind of working through that um, and figuring out how to reopen and when and keep people safe. So I, as far as I've seen, there hasn't been a, you know, any kind of we're reopening on this day kind of um, report yet. Um, but, you know, all I can really say is kind of keep your eyes on the news for that one. There's um, a lot of people reporting on it and hopefully there'll be some more positive news on that front. But ultimately, even when it opens up, we're going to feel that ripple effect for a while. That's kind of the overall um, message of this presentation is the ripple effect and to keep to keep that in mind um, that any any little thing that you see in the news um, is going to have a bigger global effect. So it's not the most um, uh, good news, but it is a part of shipping internationally. And unfortunately, we're in a really kind of rough time. Um, but yeah, so that, you know, is kind of all the questions we've had um, submitted. Uh, if you guys, you know, have any others, please remember, you can always reach out to our emails um, and to us. Um, we monitor, you know, all of our different things, our Facebook page, comments on YouTube, things like that. So you can always reach out. I know it's a really frustrating time, but hopefully we can all just, you know, maybe be frustrated together and figure out some answers. Uh, so in that vein, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to attend today's webinar. Uh, we know that this is an, a confusing and unprecedented, unprecedented time and the TRG team really wants to just provide support where we can. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out directly to me um, at marketing at traderiskguarantee.com. Additionally, check out our blog at traderiskguarantee.com slash trgpeak. It's got a treasure trove of excellent articles and information. We are actually, um, you know, planning a, a blog redesign in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully that resource will just get better soon. And don't forget, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and of course, YouTube. We will be sending a follow-up email, um, I'm hoping tomorrow, uh, with links from this presentation, um, as well as a recording of the presentation itself. So look out for that in your inbox. Again, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. I hope you know we helped provide some information um, where we could. Thanks again.